Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 35 of IGEL Weekly. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got uh, Chris Feeney with me. Chris, uh, you ready for U.S. Thanksgiving Turkey Day? Uh, getting ready. Uh, we've uh, My daughter's flying home today, and then uh, we're getting in the car tomorrow and driving to see my family down in Georgia. So I'm not excited about the drive because <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a lot of other folks on the road, but uh, but it'll be good to have everybody together. So. What's, uh, I mean, that's a normal drive for a holiday for you guys. Is it uh, three hours, five hours? Uh, six with no traffic ish. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we haven't seen, we haven't been there in a while. So we've always, you know, stayed around town mostly. And uh, this will be the first time we've all gotten in the car and drove yeah. to grandmother's house. Essentially. Well, that, so. that sounds good. And I, Good luck with that, and hopefully uh, it all goes well. I, the idea of having to drive six hours to uh, to a family. Here's the best part. I have four drivers now. <laughs> <laughs> so I like, we we bought this, this Honda CRV that, uh, I don't know why I'd, I went with this one versus the all-wheel drive version, but this one had the DVD player thing in, in the back. Yeah. And, you know, the kids were a little bit older for that, but we were like, ah, whatever. Let's... So I'm like, Hey, if my son wants to drive, I'm gonna hop in the back and watch something. <laughs> yeah. So and you're good. You're good with your kids driving. My kids drive all over the place, right? But I don't ride with them. When I when I ride with them, I drive. Uh right. I'm normally the one that's clocking the miles. Uh, it would be a a test of uh, patience, perhaps. But yeah, well, we'll Seb, see. Seb, when you guys go to visit Grandma, do you guys jump in a car and drive six hours, or you hop on a train? How's that work? No, in Germany, everyone's loving this car. So we are just driving, driving as fast as possible. Um, doesn't matter <laughs> if you see your grandma after that, or if you die just because you wanted to see her. So no, no, we are driving, we are taking the car mostly. Yeah, okay. So I have this misconception that uh, in the Northeast of the United States and well, maybe I'm totally wrong there, but uh, in Europe that most people hop on a train and get to where they're going uh, when it's more than an hour or two drive. It might happen in uh, other countries than Germany, because in Germany, you, you're, you're lucky if the train is hitting the train station in general. So I'm not even speaking of five or 10 minutes delay, but if it's coming or not coming. So it's a little bit gambling around. Yeah. So no, taking the car is definitely the best alternative. Hmm. Okay. So it's it's very similar than here. Where you just get Apparently. in the car and you go when you're ready. And then on holidays, like we have coming up this week with Thanksgiving, you, you, you sit in a lot of traffic um, quite often. Oh, yeah. So Chris, uh, this trip of yours, you'll get there, have dinner, spend the night and come back or will you stay for a long weekend? Uh, we are coming back. We're going to try to get tickets to the NC State UNC game Friday night. Okay. So uh, a meaningful game in November, always a meaningful game between those two, but extra yeah. special. Yeah, so. well, let me know. Uh, we'll be there. My, I'll have about 30 people will be tailgating if you're looking for somewhere to hang out. Well, let me know. I'll, I'll bring the kids and we'll we'll hang out. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll probably get a ticket from somebody, you know, waving them around. So yeah. yeah. Derek Murr has a spot. We're going to meet up with him about five o'clock. Nice. Yeah. Well, we'll try have, to get back uh, in grandma's house in time. You guys have uh, you know, football over there, what we call soccer here. Um, do people meet up for hours in advance and tailgate prior to the uh, event or you just show up at the event yes. and have a party? No, it's definitely definitely the same approach. Um, the only difference, I would say, that uh, for the moment, most of the stadiums are, yeah, let's say, a little bit limited in uh, in amount of people. So it's not the same feeling uh, like in the year 2018 or just before COVID. So for the moment, in Germany, the numbers are increasing quite heavily. So we are hitting a fourth or five wave. It depends from the region where you are. And we are facing the next lockdown situations in some specific regions. So I would say before COVID, it was exactly the same like you described it. But right now, it's a little bit mixed up. People do not want to join or do not want to go to the stadium or try to avoid bigger crowds of, of people. So that's, I would say, still back to uh, something unusual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the game Chris was talking about, that's just like one college football game out of 100 this weekend, and there'll be 50,000 people all jammed into a stadium. Um, hopefully vaccinated, hopefully you've had it, whatever. I think we've, we've kind of decided, some of us in the U.S., is, we're moving on. Mm -hmm. We're going to go do it, whatever it is. 
All right. Well, um, Seb, thanks for picking the topic for us. Let me bring it up on the screen here so I get it right. So the topic you picked is how to configure IGEL UMS to send notifications and device report uh, emails, device reports, emails. Um, what kind of notifications are we talking? This is a video blog that you guys did, but you have it broken out here and in, in covering what's in the what's in the, the video. Um, help, help us out with the introduction. What what is this topic and why does it matter? Well, we are creating a specific expectation with that title, and I can be honest, we will not fulfill that just for a simple reason. Um, what you as the user and administrator are expecting from a report is not something that we are delivering for the moment to his UMS. Let's say metrics from the device. Let's say uh, you're looking for active monitoring of the device. That all the stuff that is not something that we can deliver for the moment. But in the meantime, where we have that, and that's something which I would call also a report is, Let's imagine that you want to list in quite regular base, let's say one times a week, which devices are located in Germany because you need that for your, uh, for your billing department. Or you need to uh, describe which UD3s are at the moment online in a specific location because you need that for your CMDB, so for your change management database or for some assets. Let's imagine in the further step that you want to have an update job, which will update the firmware of, the, of your devices, and you would like to get a report every morning after an update task, which kind of devices are still on the old firmware, or in the contrary, which, for which devices are already on a newer firmware. So, so Seb, are these, are these yeah. reports for people who don't have access to UMS? Is that one of the main reasons why you're doing it? Uh, yes and no. Um, if, yes, for the for, for the main people, because uh, your billing department do not need an access to the UMS web app, neither to the UMS console. Yes. But on the other hand, we are also speaking about the administrators who are not looking in the universal measurement suite every day. And that's something which I'm seeing quite often in the community or in former times in the pre-sales. You set up the UMS, you have already all your automatic registration tasks, your default directory rules, and everything is staging more or less automatically. So you are looking one times a month, maybe sometimes even less, the UMS console. So if you just want to get a report, and that's what we are calling an administrative task, sending out something via email, that's also something that we are targeting. And the last one, and then I will shut up, I promise, is as soon as you have a report um, as a CSV file, like export any device from a UMS to a CSV file that could then easily be imported on a regular base to your asset inventory tracker, uh, to your asset inventory leading system like your CMDB, where you want to get asset information about all the devices that you deployed via Azure OS. Okay, so, so Chris, I'll let you jump in here. This is obviously at least one phase of it's a business decision type of thing where you're we're going to jump into how to do it here in a second. But the idea that you would do it at all is so that you know, people who aren't looking at UMS either because they can't or because they're just not proactively doing this type of discovery once a day, once a week, once a month, you can proactively hit them with this report. And then as Seb was just pointing out, you can then take that data and import it into some type of management server that handles all of IT. Um, Seb, is getting it through this report the only way to get it into that um, more, more holistic, uh, let's say like ServiceNow platform, or is there ways to tie well, hold on. Let me just stop with part one. Chris, the business justification for why people need to understand this. You want to chime in? Yeah, I think um, we talk about, you know, obviously the, uh, the cost of ownership and, you know, how many people does it take to actually manage IGEL once it's up and running. And so uh, I think something having, having that data, you know, uh, coming out of the system and, uh, and also just have it automated. So it's not a, just a manual effort are requiring you know that that time just getting this set up and having it on a schedule makes a whole lot of sense um you know for, for a variety of reasons I, I i am curious to see how many businesses have actually gone out and done something like this uh, that that's something i'm going to take away and just try to start quizzing and find out if this is a regular thing that they often do um or is it one of these like oh i didn't realize i could do that Yeah, we'll, we'll find out, right? Well, and maybe we'll follow up and talk to some folks. Um, Seb, the idea that this mail 
export is one way to get it exported and then imported. I, it does bring me to the question of mm -hmm. you guys have people writing plugins that allow you to pull this data from UMS and put it into things like ServiceNow. Is that something because that's something that we as a partner should be doing and, and working on for you guys? Yes, basically that's exactly the point. Um, even if the export function we are speaking of today is not the connector, so the REST API that we are using called IMI, the actual management interface, because that's basically the connector where a ServiceNow consultant or whoever uh, from our partner network like Syntagra could write a script to retrieve the data from the UMS, but in that case, not only retrieving the information, but also sending comments to the device. That's something that we will not cover today because it's a huge topic, the REST API, but that's more the connectors that I'm looking for. But if you want to consume the information from the UMS and only want to consume them to import them then to ServiceNow, yes, that's exactly right. So that's one of the typical jobs that you would do by using an email or an export to file system of a view. But the view, the term view is something that we'll cover in a couple of seconds, I guess. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's um, let's jump into how to do it uh, sure. in, the, in the video blog in the vlog, I guess. Um, well, in the blog, you break down the different sections. Step one is set up the mail relay. Yeah. And as you're talking through this, I'm going to jump over for the people who can see the video at a later date uh, and kind of show where you're at uh, in the video itself. So you mm -hmm. get a visual, but help us uh, understand uh, the reason why uh, and then how to set up the mail relay. Sure. So the first thing I want to mention is that setting up a mail relay inside of the UMS doesn't give the UMS the ability to write you extensive reports or sending out active notification. It's really just configuring the general ability to send out something via mail. So that's what we are covering in the UMS administration part. So just in case we are still speaking about the UMS console, not the UMS web app. And inside the UMS console, you have a specific section which is called UMS administration. It's not the UMS console, it's really the administration piece. And just before going into the configuration itself, I just want to mention again, the UMS administration is something where you can also break a lot of things and where your main UMS administrator may have restricted your access. So if you do not see the function called mail settings or any kind of icons beneath the UMS administration, it's not a bug, it's not a, a display issue. You just have missing access rights, I guess. So that's something I just want to cover because it's a question that may come up. And then, yes, um, I just took my own um, my own mail relay. So I just took our mail server that I set it up on, on Postfix. And I just sent an SMTP host, activated the SMTP certification because it's an external relay. So I just wanted to be uh, secured and I don't want to do an upper relay. And then I activated on my mail server and on the configuration of the UMS, which kind of encryption I want to use for the, uh, for the transfer. So I'm using a TLS 1.2, but I kept 1.1 and 1.0 just activated because I'm not covering only my installation, but also from uh, people out of the world. So that's the standard configuration. And as soon as you did that, so you entered an SMTP user, an SMTP server, an SMTP password, and you entered, if needed, a non-standard port, usually it would be 587, you can send out a test email. So you enter an, an email address from a recipient, in an optimal case from your own mail uh, account, send out the email, and you should receive a test email from your UMS. So just telling you, hey, email was sent out, it's great. Yep. And that's that's it, just a base that you need to get this kind of automatism working. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have flashbacks to, you know, the old days where we used to have these open mail relay servers. Uh, these days you need something like this in the configuration where it's a secure relay server. Uh, we kind of got exploited with those open, open relay servers back in the, yeah. back in the late nineties. It's still, it's, it's still actual. I mean, we still have uh, websites where open relays are listed. Uh, you cannot do so much bad things with them because there is a huge blacklisting behind them. But it, they are still listed. So it's not only in the 90s, it's still actual at the moment. So okay. misconfig misconfigured mail servers are still, still a topic today. Less than before, but they're still there. Yeah, but what you're showing here is that I just baked into the console yeah. the ability to securely relay mail off of a mail server. Exactly. Chris, any uh, quick comments on this exciting topic? 
No, I'm following along uh, as we go because I uh, I know we have something in our KB about setting up uh, like using Gmail as your mail server. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, um, in the your next case, section, uh, go ahead. This, so I was going to ask you, in your case, did you set up a, a separate mail server using like something owned by some company that you use? Yeah, right. No, it's on my, let's say, personal V server. So I just set it right. up there, uh, a postfix. So. Okay. Hey, and Seb, this uh, this asterisk here, what what was this password? Mm -hmm. What was the password for that? Uh, it's a star, 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 star. Oh, that's don't forget the, the uppercase star because that's important. And no, no one would ever guess that one. <laughs> exactly. And you, you, you caught that one. You didn't even, you didn't even hesitate. You just went, played right along. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> next section of the video that we're talking about in the blog is the four minute and 30 section mark where we talk about send out a view via mail. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to fast forward in the video that I'm highlighting here, but tell us uh, what you're covering in that section. So, I assume that you all from our listeners already have seen the UMS console, already had registered an endpoint, and as soon as you click one time an endpoint, you get in the middle of the screen the asset information. When I speak about asset information, I mean which kind of CPU is installed, how many how many RAM is installed, which kind of storage device is uh, sorry, which kind of storage is installed, uh, which IP address is holding the device at the moment. So basically, all the software and hardware information of your endpoint. What we can do is create reports out of them and say, hey, list me more or less every device in my UMS that is online, is offline, or is having two gigabyte of storage or four, or is only having two gigabyte of RAM. I mean, more or less everything that you see in your asset feed can be filtered or be shown in a view. So a view, we already covered that in, a, in an earlier podcast, but just to recover it, a view is, in my definition, um, a filter, an active filter of something like hardware information, a specific firmware version that your device is having or not having, and it will show you that dynamically in the UMS. So after having that uh, dynamic filter activated, we thought it would be great to have the ability to export that, the, we call it view, this view as a file. So you can right click your view after the creation and say, okay, now that I fitted all the devices that is having uh, the Azure OS 11.06.100 version, please right click, save it uh, to the file system. That's the easy way. So you can then choose between XML, CSV, uh, HTML, and uh, CS info, if I remember right. And you can use it for whatever you like. But that's the manual step. And since you do not want to do that, let's say one time a day, one time a week, or however, uh, how often you want to do that, we have the ability to send them out directly via email to a specific recipient list. And that's besides the fact that you can store it into your file system. If you right click your UMS view, that's what I'm covering in the tutorial, you can then send it out directly to a recipient. I would say it's not something which is extremely usual because I would prefer to store it on my, on my local storage and then open it besides having that sent out via an email. So that's just testing that everything is working like expected. Right. And then in the next step is as soon as you, as you tested that is to create an, a task, a, a scheduled task, which is sending out that view on a regular basis to a specific amount of people in a specific format. And now coming back to the UMS administration part, which we call for the mail setting, we have there the so-called administrative tasks. So we already covered that also in our earlier podcast, so please join us there. Uh, but the administrative task can be used for creating backups of your local embedded database, can be used for assigning profiles to a view, etc. But one specific piece, which we cover today, is that we can send out um, configurations or send out also uh, view results via email. And that's what we are covering by creating an admin task where you have to choose the view that you want to export via email, a mail recipient. And if I remember right, the uh, format that you want to use. So CSV, HTML, uh, CSV, HTML, CS, CS info, and XML. And as soon as you did that, you only have to set up your task itself and saying, hey, I want to get that email sent out every Sunday morning after my 
scheduled update task to see if I get more devices with 11.06 or showing the device who didn't reach the, the update. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking and you, okay, so this is kind of baked in this view, this view report piece and the built in is, are these directories, containers? What would you call these things that were associated in these views, the view ID? What is that associated with? And the view ID is basically exactly the view that we created before. So let's imagine that you created a view uh, for all devices that are online. You will click the dot, dot, dot button inside of your admin task and select that view. And instead of having the name shown, you will see the ID, but just an alias for that, not more. Yeah, so, that, so, so if I'm not mistaken, that view ID is basically the same thing when you create a profile, the profile gets a number. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so I guess it all ties back into the database at the end of the day. Yeah. It's a unique identifier of everything that you created inside of the UMS. So like Chris uh, mentioned, uh, everything which you created or get created automatically inside the UMS get a unique ID, which can be shown just a general information. If you hover your mouse over an endpoint or a profile or a directory or a view, you will see then uh, uh, just a number, that number in the, in the ID. That's right, thank you, Chris. Yeah, no worries. I'm actually getting uh, ideas, watching, uh, thinking about this uh, onboarding ideas. I mean, there's probably so many different ways you could probably leverage this. Uh, you mentioned the um, the firmware updates. I remember hearing a story from one of our customers where they had basically automated a lot of the activity within UMS. Um, and one of those things was, you know, being tasked like we we always had, you know, you know, zero false positives on our firmware updates. And versus Windows updates where we might get a message like we had, you know, 100 devices that didn't quite get it or something, but mm -hmm. they were leveraging some of these uh, automation pieces. And I think some of that IMI capability too with the API. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is um, I have all kinds of ideas, uh, maybe experiments to play around with this now are coming through my head. Yeah, we kind of talked about this going into it as if it was less than exciting information and it, you know, maybe it's not going to set the world on fire, but it's, it's very applicable to being a IGEL administrator and having this type mm -hmm. of capability proactively. Um, it's, you know, it's nothing to apologize about. It's some people no, no. Know, how to know, know how to do. I mean, there was a, a specific use case that I have seen a couple of times beside the report of updating firmware on, on your endpoint. Let's imagine that you want to get a notification about uh, zombie devices in your UMS. What, what I call zombie devices are devices that never went uh, online since six months. Yeah. Never hit the UMS anymore since eight months or whatever. And you want to maybe first uh, delete them because of security reasons, but also maybe because of billing reasons. And you might also want to free up the licenses inside of your IGEL licensing portal. And if you get that kind of notification, I guess you can be more proactive than just wanting to look at the report inside of UMS. You have to start it, you have to look at the view, you have to interpret it, you have to add some columns maybe. And if you get a notification every, let's say one time a month, that's something that you can then give to your service desk and asking, hey, could you maybe please call uh, the user, uh, John Smith and asking him if it's still alive and seeing if his device is, is still needed. Yeah. And that's something which is a use case that I'm seeing quite often on the, on the main notification too. I, I have that use case here where I would love to proactively start telling people, hey, we have these zombie devices, many of mm -hmm. them created by me in my testing along the way. Uh, I'm sure we have that and I'm sure no one's looking. It would be nice to proactively push that notification to people to tell them you need to clean up. Yeah. So that's just, just I mean, we had already covered also the, the billing department who needs maybe to send out a bill to, to a customer because you want to get a, a proper MAC address list of devices that went out for the customer, I don't know, GM or whatever, and say, okay, I want to get that every month because I have to do a billing based on the amount of devices, uh, maybe all just be of a specific amount of online devices. So that's the billing approach. Uh, we have the update approach, we have the removing devices approach, but we might also have the uh, 
the ability to help to create a view out of all devices because you have a life cycle process in your company that is saying, hey, every device which is not uh, having, let's say, two gigahertz of, of CPUs, clock speed as a standard, is something that we need to replace in the next six months. That's also something that is covered by this kind of report. I mean, it's not just the, the administrative task of sending out email, which is important, but having a view, having the admin task, and being able to get an email, because it's something that we are used to use on a daily basis on, your, on our cell phones or good mail clients. Well, yeah. that's a great point. I think that last one you just mentioned, right? So let's, there's several scenarios in my head, right? Um, uh, let's assume somebody has been using IGEL for a while, had repurposed some machines, and then you know, like anything, technology changes are coming. What what are those changes? Well, we're going to start implementing some new thing that's going to require more horsepower on the endpoint than what we currently have. You could do a view that says, right, well, what, what are the specs I'm looking for that, that are currently below that and have this go out and email you this report or you can generate on the fly, whatever. And then you have an accurate list of, all right, well, we've got, you know, a thousand machines that are completely fine, but we've got 50 that, won't be able to handle what these new requirements are and they're going to be targeted for replacement or something right so that's one scenario that i'm thinking through and then you definitely can consistently send the people who need that information that information until the problem's gone mm -hmm. then you can stop yeah right you can just uh, that view you can just target it and as those devices get out of the system that list gets down from 50 down to 10 or zero at some point yeah and let's face it, we're IT guys. We'd rather create a task, automate it, send them an email instead of having to talk to them. Yep, I agree. <laughs> of course. All right, so let me figure out where we're at here. So we've uh, we've talked about the topic. We've set up the mail relay, a uh, secure mail relay. Uh, we've uh, sent out a test view via mail to make sure it worked. Uh, we've now scheduled a task to... Um, to uh, create the general movement of what we're going to do here. And now the next section at 8.05 into the video says, send out results of admin tasks. So the admin mm -hmm. task, uh, what we just went through, to, that doesn't actually send it out or that doesn't send it out scheduled. What, what's this next section at, eight, at the 8.05 mark doing for us? It's more like a kind of chicken and egg. So you create an admin task to sending out a specific a specific view as an exported CSV file. Uh -huh. But still remember that every task that you can execute as an admin task can also fail for whatever reason. So let's imagine you have created a backup job inside of your admin task. It might fail because of missing file space. What the UMS can do is sending out a notification via email as soon as the task is not working properly. Oh, got it. So I'm not, I have to be honest, yeah. it's not the best notification in the world, but you will still get something, which is better than nothing. So you trust that it's going to work, but you also verify that it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, you're going to, you're going to notify that the notification didn't work. Yeah, exactly. That's yes. I'm just going through the list of admin tasks. Yeah, so, if, so I guess if the task ends up in a uh, in a one or some type of error code, that's when this task kicks off. Is that how we're configuring yeah. this? Exactly. So, so here's just, one I just mm -hmm. thought of. I was looking at so an administrative task might be you're going to assign objects, profiles, uh, wallpapers, whatever, to devices that are in a view, and you schedule that to run on a Friday afternoon or whatever. And then you uh, want to get notification of that. Did it work or not? And that would be one where you say, well, I got 20 devices that received the updates and five that did not. And it could be that they're offline. And when they come back online, they're going to be fine. But at least you know that, hey, you know, that, that task executed fine. It's just we got five devices that are not yet received them. So that's a great point, Chris. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, just Coming back to the topic just before, one use case that I'm seeing also combined with uh, what Chris just said is, you want to create a view about 
devices who are not having the latest state of configuration. So that's a view that you can create since you're my six or eight, if, if I remember right, where you can say, hey, um, as soon as the device is getting a blue eye, which is meant by um, have not having the latest configuration, but will be retrieved after the next boot up, that's something that you can also create out of a report. So, um, but that's, you know, just coming back to the, to the main topic. So where it was on, uh, on the time scale, uh, Andy was right. So I just sent out, I just created a job which uh, I wanted to get a notification by default so that they send results uh, as email. So I'm getting a notification if it worked or not. So in both cases, I'm getting a successful or an error report as soon as um, the job is running. In specific cases, I get only the error messages, so only the errors why it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So just so I'm clear, with the ideas, we mm -hmm. have these scheduled tasks that send out these views via email, and then we have a task that runs that checks the scheduled task uh, and the result of that scheduled task. And if that shows some indication that it failed, then you're going to get an alternative alert, or you're getting the alert either way, success or fail. Yeah. So the last one. So we, I must admit that some you're just getting the error, but in uh, the administrative task, creating a backup case, you will get a notification if it worked or if it didn't work. So in both cases, you will get a notification. So you have to pass for the content um, to get it maybe implemented into your uh, monitoring system. And, and the reality here is the, the ability to do it one way or the other is there. It's just a matter of what you decide your logic is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, do we move on to the next section that sends yeah, out, yeah. Uh, send out ICG config? So uh, send out the IGEL Cloud Gateway. That's what ICG stands for, config. I haven't really thought about where this applies. This is at the 11.20 mark of your video. Why do I want to send out the ICG config to somewhere? Uh, so we first assume that you already had an ICG, so a Cloud Gateway server set up and connected to UMS, um, that the communication is working properly between your UMS and your ICG server. So let's, let's imagine now that you are sending out a UD pocket to a user in Brazil or in France or wherever. And you do not want to enroll the device or the UD pocket before sending it out because of security reasons, because it might get stolen, it might be booted up on a non-trusted hardware, whatever reason. So you send out a blank UD pocket with the Agile REST installed on it, but not configured. So I'm sending it out to John Smith to, to Brazil. And he is connecting his UD pocket next morning to a device and through the first one wizard of Agile OS, so after the first boot up, he has to configure uh, his region, his language, his keyboard layout. So after a couple of stuff, like setting up uh, a proper time and date server, he is then hitting the ICG connection with that, where he has to enter a server address and usually a one-time or multiple time password that someone sent over to him. And that's where sending out that information via email directly from the UMS comes in. So basically, you could easily copy the information from the UMS console, press Control C, go to your email client, enter the email address, and press Control V, and paste the information. No question. But you can also send them out directly from the UMS itself, assuming that you have installed the mail relay that we covered in the first section, and then sending out uh, to John Smith at johndoe.com his email with the, uh, the server address, with the port he has to use, if needed, the different fingerprints of, um, of his certificate, and obviously the registration uh, code that he is using for the ICG registration. And so, that's we are using. So Seb, I guess I misunderstood that in my head. We're not sending out the configuration of the ICG appliance. We're sending out the endpoints yeah. configuration of their connection to the ICG IGEL Cloud Gateway. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Well, that makes sense. I was trying to figure out why we were trying to export the ICG config. We oh, are right. exporting all these devices that are coming in from the wild <laughs> Wild Wild West and letting whoever know what that config is and what they need to know about it. That makes sense. Yeah. Chris, can you see uh, relevance for this part of the conversation? Yeah, I think it's a lot of it is deployment. Like like when, uh, when for people started going home for the first time uh, just over a year plus ago, we got a lot of 
questions about, you know, the uh, the, uh, trying to get people connected in through the ICG and that type of thing. And so um, uh, whether it's using this or another method or something, I mean, we even added some functionality where I think you could push configs to devices before they were sent home. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, that way they already have it. So there's uh, maybe a, a task there that uh, um, uh, assign you know that to a, a view or something, and then run the run the tat run the uh, mail report to see if that got assigned before they get out the door. And next thing you know, they're calling the help desk because they can't figure out how to connect correctly. But um, yeah, I, I again just another thing that uh, we've got sort of out of the seven thousand settings or something or. <laughs> some really uh, interesting scenarios here to think through there's there's data and configurations beyond what i even what well, i even come close to yeah. thinking is in here and you know chris you do this stuff all day every day and every time we have one of these podcasts i can kind of see light bulbs going off so that must be way beyond what you even know and you live this thing yeah i mean there's certainly some ideas are popping up based on uh either uh internal communication that i'm seeing or 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 from talking with other, you know, just partners or, or customers or whatever. So, um, but I think that the the story generally is that there's a lot here that you can do uh, behind the scenes to uh, kind of automate some of the administration and stay on top of things and be alerted in a lot of cases on how it's going. And I know we've got customers where they've done a lot of that and uh, end result is they've reduced the number of people having to manage the endpoints uh, because of these tools. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I know obviously you guys have built a lot of stuff with the service now integration piece. There's, there's, uh, other capabilities there that we haven't really tapped too much into, um, uh, whether that's feeding it into a help desk ticket system or something, these are all great ideas. Yeah. we mentioned that earlier. I did. And I mean, the wheels just started turning on things that I need to go get my guys to develop as it relates to plugging into iGel and making it easy for ServiceNow customers um, almost to the point where it became overwhelming instantly for me, but that definitely something that needs to be worked on. And, and we as an iGel partner and a ServiceNow partner need to figure out how to make that one of our initiatives in 2022, make, make that easy for people to consume. Because mm -hmm. right, if we do that, then uh, the need to email it out kind of, I don't want to say goes away, but uh, it it takes a, a smart process and puts it into a smart system that's customers already spending probably millions of dollars on. Let's use it. Yeah. I was thinking of us uh, earlier, uh, getting this set up and using email that if it hits a mailbox or something, you could, uh, even with like office 365, you could, uh, use like the power automate to, uh, generate something and feed into some workflow. Uh, email comes in, uh, case in point we, we would get emails when a new firmware build was out and uh and one of the engineers kind of developed a, a power automate thing that would feed that automatically into a team's channel where it would post and you whenever you need to go figure out where it was it was always right there and it had basically it copied the email in there so you had all the details about the, the firmware build um but it was all generated from an email that you'd get from the engineering team so you could easily do something like that and feed it into those types of tools. So Seb, the, uh, the last section of your video, uh, the title of it you have in the, in the blog that was written is additional important pieces of information. Sounds important. What does that mean? It's basically the general tasks that you have in the, in the UMS. We have a couple of, not a couple, we have a lot of users and administrative uh, administrators who are using the jobs section of the, of the UMS. And we're not speaking about the administrative tasks who are really administrative related stuff that you want to do to a specific time. But you are thinking of, I want to reboot my device every weekend. I want to update all my devices in a specific folder and that on boot up every morning. I want to send out the last configuration to all my devices. So basically all the device related jobs. That's something that you can also cover in uh, the reporting function that we have in, in the UMS, which will then send out a notification in case of an error or whatever. So that's just something I wanted to mention because I 
maybe didn't make it clear enough uh, as when we were speaking about the administrative task. So we also have the job section and the job section is, or is also covered by that notification uh, method by sending out an email. Okay. I think, uh, I think what you're really highlighting here is that the IGEL solution endpoint is very advanced, but the management piece of it, which, you know, from my original conversations with IGEL six, seven years ago now was what was touted as the difference maker continues to shine as the reason why IGEL is a leader in the space. Yeah. And Seb's a guy who knows knows where it's all buried. That's, uh, you know, I talked to Doug the other day and I, I kind of got Doug pigeonholed as the technical guy because of his background, but really, you know, Doug's the community leader and your guy knows where all the, where all the, how, how long have you been doing this, Seb? Uh, working for Agile, you mean? Yeah. Seven and a half years now. Okay. So do so you know everything? Such a long time. Uh, no, not at all. Not even close to that. <laughs> not even close. I would be so happy to know everything, but uh, we have a couple of people in, in the US and Europe who are knowing way more than me. And yeah. I would like to eat their brains if I could. But that's something which is not legal, I guess. Well, I was going to say that probably didn't translate to English very well, but I think that's exactly what you meant. <laughs> yep, more or less. Uh, this Frenchman. Uh, okay. Well, this is awesome, Seb. This is actually really valuable content. And I think the main takeaway from the conversation we're just having about your knowledge of this, you know a lot. And if you don't, you know uh, where to go find the information. Yeah, that's this right. is a lot about the reason why you're so involved in the community and why you've been tagged, um, not just but the knowledge, but the passion for helping people figure these things out. So now I know where to go when I need something. I, I think I've known Please. for a while, but uh, I didn't put two and two together the way I have today on this podcast. Happy if I can help. Chris, uh, anything before we let you guys go and you go drive six hours to grandma's house? Um, yeah, if there's a way you can magically make traffic not appear, that'd be awesome. But uh, I, uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. So but no, it's been great, guys. I've already thinking about some cool ideas on, on what we can do here. Uh, and uh, look forward to hopefully having a blog, more blogs about it later. Oh, yes, please. Well, Seb, thanks for bringing this topic up. Any, uh, any parting words before we, uh, before we let, let you go? No, more is just wanting to send out a great uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. I mean, that's something which is not so usual in Europe, but I know that it's a really a big time for all the US citizens. So I'm just sending out all my best wishes for you and your families and hoping that you will party as much as possible. Yeah, I like to think uh, it's a party, but it's, uh, I'm not sure how you would tie Thanksgiving into party for a lot of us. It's more of an obligation, but it's something we need to do okay. for family purposes. Got it. Chris, you're going, going to party. Both are. You're going to grandma's house to party? Uh, Is that how you look at um, it? Well, I'm, yeah, we'll celebrate. I mean, yeah. uh, I'll bring my guitar. I love, you know, jamming. Yeah. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll make merry. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, break out the eggnog, pumpkin pie. Let's roll. Well, the pumpkin pie definitely is uh, is worth the drive, typically. Yeah. Yep. All, All right, right guys. Thank well, you. Thanks for joining. We'll do it again in a week. All right. Take Peace. care. You too, guys. Bye-bye.